Hello, my name is Mark Delacros, and I'm the product lead for Lorelink, um, a campaign management tools for GMs, DMs, record keepers, and chroniclers. I'm here today to walk through a simple campaign creation to show you how Lorelink works and all the bits and pieces of it and how we pull it all together to build out a campaign. If we start here on your My Campaign screen, as you can see, it's got a list of various different campaigns. You can sort by what type of campaign you currently have. All of these are currently in draft. If I had some in active, those would show up for that. If I had some archived, I could click on that. I can also just do a simple list view if I don't want the graphics. Or I can also reorder the list and put it in my own way. So any ones that I have currently I feel are important, I can move to the top. So if I feel morning after is more important, I can save that and then go back to the screen and now morning after is the first one in the list. But let's talk about actually creating a new campaign. So go over here to create a new campaign, click on that. Here you can set that status if you want to say you're creating one that's already active or you can create one that's in draft or you can set it to archived if you don't want it to show up in the list. Uh, we'll give this campaign a name. Well, I've had an idea kicking around in my head of a seven samurai type game with paladins instead. And we will use a system, we'll do Pathfinder 2nd Ed. The system itself is not necessarily important. We do not enforce a particular system. We have tools for various systems that will help aid them, but in all in all, we are system agnostic. So let's give this a quick description. Um, a priest from a forgotten temple approaches seven paladins of differing faith, asking them to defend a temple under a relic under sea from an undead lord and his minions. And then the introduction might be what you use to describe it to your players, what you're going to actually tell them at the start. So it might be you give them a, maybe it's more of a movie trailer type thing. Uh, basically, and this is a WYSIWYG editor. It's also Markdown. So you'll see if I highlight this and click bold, it puts in the Markdown code for me. So I don't necessarily have to know the markdown code in order to actually execute it. So that puts it in there. You've got your various different things, italics, italics, you can put images in, you can increase the levels, you can increase the headings. And then here you can just, if you need to remove it, you can just go in and remove it. Let's go ahead and save this. And then we will move on into actually creating the campaign itself. So when I save it, I get brought into here. Now you can see we're on the actual campaign screen itself. We have various different types of objects and items that we can create here. We have more information about the campaign that we can fill in. One of the things about Lorelink is that we know the fact that we have not covered every detail. So if you find yourself wanting to add a particular custom field, uh, say for example, you're running this as a uh, Pathfinder Society game or maybe Adventure League and you want to add in information which are specific to those different continual play, living play type games, you can add those in here so you can record those details there so you don't have to try to shoehorn them into description or introduction. We also have images up here so if you have a an icon or something like that, you saw on the previous page all of the icons basically had little background images to them. So if I want to, let's say, for example, I think, oh, I've got a, I've got an image here. Let's go with this one as our kind of mood type image for this. And we'll do that for the title, the background, as it were, as well. Go back to people and then we will pick that same image there. 
These are all images that I have uploaded to my image library. We'll talk about that more later. But note the fact that I have folders I can search through. I can search by words. I can just do an entire search of everything rather than go to a particular folder. But for example, if I'd rather, if I wanted to be smarter, I could have typed in Golden Knight and it would have pulled up that Golden Knight one. Also note the fact that we at Lorelink do take accessibility seriously. So we make sure that we have things like image titles and alt text right here. So you can add those in so that you know, this isn't an, this is an, an, an afterthought. You can see them here. You can load them in. They will be available from the moment that you create them. So let's go ahead and insert that one. And then we'll save that. And now that image has been updated. And if we come back, basically we go back to the campaign page. We'll see that our icon is here. It has it in draft status. It's got that icon in the background. So we can click on it and we're taken back here and we can see in the background, our image is also loaded there as well, giving the page a little bit of color. All right, so the next step is of course, the, always the tricky one. When you're GM, there's a lot of different starting points for how you want to create a campaign. Maybe you want to create a campaign that is based around events and things like that. And that's how you build it out is you have a bunch of events in your mind. Maybe it's more of a dungeon crawl and you're all about the location and you want to build the locations out. Maybe you're more character based and you want to, you want to create characters or creatures or villains and you want to build it out from there. Or maybe you're more of a historian type and you like to build out your world and all of the events and things like that and build up a timeline based around that. All of those are valid and Lorelink does not force you to pick one to start with. You can bounce around and we'll get into that here in a bit. But just know the fact that this video, while it is long, does have chapter marks that you can see in the description below uh, that will link you to the various different points in here where we discuss the various different sections. So if you come to this video and you're looking for a particular section, just go ahead and click on that below and that will take you to the area that is in the video where we talk about that particular section of Lorelink. For now, let's say, let's go ahead and basically move on. And I think we'll start with events. All right, before I go much further, let me take care of some quick housekeeping things in here. Things that may be helpful in navigation and buttons and things like that, just to make it easy as possible for you to get around. Whenever you're on a list, you will see at the top of a list, we have these filter box. So if you need to filter down, you want to see stuff that says city in it, you can type in city and it filters it down. Whatever you want, you can filter it by that. Each of the rows on top can be sorted by name, short description, status, whether something is ad active or not. The active status has to do with this button over here. You have archived. So again, if you want to have something that is you want to keep it around because maybe you have important notes associated with it, but maybe the character died and you really don't need that showing up in all of your notes again and again and again. You can easily just use this archive feature. So if I go into something like the ambush on the end, maybe I decided I'm well, really not going to do that, but maybe I've got some useful ideas in there. Maybe I'll bring it back later. I can mark it as archive, save it. And now if I go out back to events, it no longer appears in the list of events and active events. If I click show archived, it will then pop up as an archive thing so I can quickly still see it and get to it. It still exists. It's still here. It is marked as archived on the top just to make sure that you know, and you can always just unarchive it just as simple as that. And that allows you to bring it back into the list. And now it's back there with everything else. Sometimes you may have something you're like, oh, that was a really good idea, but I want to create another one kind of like it with a few things tweaked. You can quickly just duplicate it. So you click on duplicate. It'll tell you how you want to duplicate it. You can change the name, the defaults to copy of. You can say which things come along with it. Do you want to take notes? Do you want to take its tags? Do you want to take associated game objects and triggers? For locations, it may be associated locations, child locations, things like that. All of that can be in here and you can click this copy and it will let you duplicate a existing event just like this existing event or location or character. Most of these have this in this action bar thing here. We talked about being able to archive things. Sometimes you don't want to have to go into everything and you're like, okay, none of these ideas worked. You can click on multiple here with selected. 
You can duplicate multiple, you can archive multiple, and you can just click on like archive. And it'll say, okay, archive lore may not appear in some of your lists. Like archive stuff will generally not appear in when you are linking between things, because if you've archived it, you said you're not really, it's not really active. So we don't want to include it in lists like that. So just be aware if you archive something, it's not going to show up in your searches elsewhere in the system. So you click archive. Now both of those have been marked as archive. You can always go back in there and basically remove them. And if you don't want to see archive, click hide archived and they're gone. On any page, you will generally see, we have a set of buttons that will generally appear in the corner here. And every page will have this plus, which will let you quick create any of these type of lore that you need, tags, characters, locations, events. So if you have an idea and you want to capture it quickly, use the quick create to do that. When you're on a given page, the save button is there just so you can, wherever you are on the page, you can quickly save whatever it is you want to save. Generally at the top, if the lore has things associated with it, like game objects or triggers, you can click these buttons and it'll take you directly to the association page right here. So you don't have to scroll down to that section. And last, the notes thing, whenever you're dealing with something, you may have a note that you just want to throw on it. And we wanted to make sure you can quickly and easily just add notes to things. And so that note button is going to always be there. Even if you're viewing this, basically this button up here in the corner, by the way, the eye switches it to view mode, the pencil switches it to edit. But if you're in view mode, note that your save button goes away and any fields which haven't been filled out go away. But notes are always there because even if you're running a game and you don't want to mess around typing things or anything like that, notes are there as a quick way of just throwing a note down. You'll also tend to see this grid up here in the corner. What this tells you is what things are associated with other things. So if you come back to the events page, it's like, okay, you've linked some of these things. You haven't linked these other things, other events. This is so you can even you've linked events to some game objects. This is so you know the fact that like, oh, hey, you know what? I've got some orphaned objects out there that I haven't really connected into other things. That's what these boxes are for, is to help you understand what have I connected to other things? Because if you're running a campaign, something that's just by itself somewhere else could get easily lost. Maybe it gets forgotten when you're playing a game. You want to be able to pick those out relatively quickly. And so that's what those grids are because we are, again, it's lore link. And so we like to be able to show you what you've linked and what you haven't because your game worlds tend to have everything interconnected in some confusing matter and things like that. But that's what lore, lore link is here to mitigate. All right, let's continue on. Hello, let's talk about events. Events in Lore Links are meant to represent periods of interaction with your players. This could be a meeting where they meet the king. You could use this to mark a time period where the players are building something out. Maybe it's a downtime series of events and they're, you've got a campaign where they're like, okay, this is where we build the, build the town or build the kingdom. If you're running something like Pathfinder's King, Kingmaker series or other things like that, it isn't necessarily forced to be just event meetings. It can be more than that. Let's go ahead and set up our meeting for this campaign. So we need to have a meeting where this priest-like character shows up and talks to the party. We're doing a very cliche, possibly meet in the tavern type thing. So let's just go ahead and create that out here. So we'll start by creating an event. We can click on this or we can click down here. We can create a new event. It's gonna pop up over here and we can either quickly type in some details or we can type them all in here. It's up to you. We have a larger screen for that, but this is more of a quick get the shell of the idea out of your head. So meeting with the priest, let's just do that. And I'm just going to save that immediately so I can show you what that looks like. It's going to add it into here and in this list. We have templates as well. What templates are for is when we last, as I was talking about campaigns, I mentioned custom fields, or maybe just you have a series of set information you want to include, and you don't want to have to retype that over and over and over again. Templates are there to help avoid repeatedly typing. So you can create a template and have it keep filling in all of that data automatically so you don't have to keep doing it. We'll talk more about that when we get to game objects. Go ahead and click on the game objects chapter if you want to know more about that. For now, let's focus on the event. So 
we've created this event and so now we're taken to the event details screen here as you can see we can add an image much like we did for the campaign if you have an idea of oh and i've got this setting in mind where i want this to take place or maybe a mood image or something like that you can add that in here we can give this a short description to help us find it when if we have a large list of events the short description will appear next to it and oftentimes when we're linking things together that short description will appear as well so let's make that clear the priest appears battered and bruised and begs the players for their help. Maybe you want this to be a little bit shorter, so we'll just call it the priest appears. Or maybe we'll put the rest of that in the description here. The priest appears battered and begs the players for their help. You can have dialogue in here. We could <clears throat> have a series of bullet points of things that the priest should mention. Like we want to make sure that they mention location of the temple, importance of the artifact, blessing of the gods. You can put that all in there. If I click on this preview, I can see what it looks like ahead of time. So I could see those bullet points if I add it in. If I wanted to italicize, italicize things just to call them out, I can do that there. And then I can save that either through the save button there or no matter where I am in the screen, I can always click the save button over here. You don't have to scroll all the way down to this save button at the bottom. We do have an archive thing. So if you come up with an idea and you decide to shelve it or maybe it's happened and you don't want to deal with seeing it in the list anymore, archive will hide it from the list. It won't delete it. We, you can delete if you want, but archiving it is a way of keeping these things without having them clutter up your screen with all of the stuff that you're going to put into here. Okay, so now that we've created the description, maybe we've got more of a script in here, but we want to link to things that we've talked about in here. So we have this priest that we've talked about, but we haven't created the priest because we decided to start with events. And that's kind of the problem you can run into as a GM is you end up in this loop of, I need to create this event. That means I need to create this character, which means I need to create this item, which means I need to create this event talking about the item. And it means I need to create the location where the item is stored. And you can end up in this loop where you're constantly coming up with this other thing that you need to build first and you can't find anywhere to start. Rather than force you to pick a starting location, what we've created is the fact that we have a quick create system that allows you to quickly just create items anywhere from where you are. So if I get to this point in here and I'm like, oh, I need to create the priest character, or at least I want to create a quick shelf so I can link to it here, I can just click on this quick create button located here. And it's going to pop up this list of all of the different, what we call lore in Lorelink that is available. So if I want to create a character quickly, I can click character. It's going to pop this open here. Game objects are our characters, our villains, our items, our transportations, our monsters all fall under game object, but we've given them slightly different names so you can organize them better. So let's go ahead and call this the priest. And maybe we have an image that we want to throw for them. Let's go with, I think I've got a, this guy's bruised and tattered. So yeah, let's take the tattered man image. We'll insert that. We can give more descriptions here or less. Again, we're creating this kind of quickly. We can save that. And now we've created that game object without having to leave our event. So now if we want, we can just associate it here. And we can see, oh, the priest is there. We can associate it. If we get to this point, we realize we haven't created it. We can create it right here, but we can go ahead and associate it. And now this priest is associated with this event. And so that if we get to this event while we're doing it, we need to look something up about it. Somebody asks, oh, hey, does he have this? Or does he have that? Or you want to make a note on the priest about something that happens. You give him a particular accent or a way of speaking, or maybe you call out a particular scar or bruise and that comes to you in the moment. You want to make a quick note, you're, but you're looking at this event here. You can hop over to the priest just like that. And then you can create a note down here with this quick button right here. Creates a new note and you can say, has, oops, 
has a long scar running down his left cheek because you decided to give that detail and you, you want to make note of that. Now you can add that there. You could have added it to the description. Now it's listed in the notes here. I can mark it as secret from the players or not. And then we can go back to the event relatively quickly. Can just go back to the event and we can go, then we can go from there. Now we've create we can create the event. We can also create triggers and other things. So we can say this event triggers another event, which triggers another event. We can associate another one. So what does quick create another event? We'll say ambush at the inn. Attack by minions. We can save that. Now we can associate that. Create trigger. And now we've created that. Now we, now we can go from this event to the next event. And we know that these events are linked together. The other thing we can do is we've talked about creating these lists down here. Sometimes you don't want to have to deal with it in lists. Maybe you want a list of things. Maybe you just want it included in your text itself. We have the ability to quickly reference it. We could say after the priest is finished speaking, skeletons bust into the inn starting and we want to put the event link to the event here now we could go to the page look it up and copy and paste the link in here but that's a lot of work and we already have all this information in the system so let's just have the system look it up so with the at symbol events and then we can say find events and then we say ambush ambush at the inn hit enter and now it's built that link out for me and if I click on that link, it's going to take me directly to, well, like if I right click and open a new tab, you can see that that takes me to the ambush at the end event. So that's kind of events in the nutshell. Events are used throughout the system. You can link events to locations. You can have a timeline, which is a series of different events that are organized differently. And you could use your sessions that you build out for your players. Could be a list of events that you intend to happen during that session. So events are used all over the place and you can link all of them through here. All right, next, let's go ahead and talk about locations and how we build those out. Locations are a complicated thing in games. Sometimes they can be as broad or as generic as the city. If you're in an urban campaign, in a more modern campaign, maybe it's a world if you're in a science fiction type campaign, or maybe it's more specific. If it could be a dungeon and your locations can come boiled down to just individual rooms, which are all connected to each other or instead of a larger structure. Maybe you have a giant sprawling castle that they're making their way through with various traps and other things. And it can get really complicated to keep track of what is where and what it is what it's related to. And maybe you sometimes have stacking conditions. And you always get that one player who wants to know every last bit about that. And you're realizing, oh, wait, I left a note about that somewhere else. And it can be a pain. So we've tried to make locations easy to navigate and get through and get around so that even when you're creating it, it's relatively straightforward. And then when you're running it, it's even easier to be able to go from point A to point B without having to go back and say, wait, where was this again in relation to what? So we have a location already created for you by default. We have something known as a campaign world. And it is just a generic location that is created that everything will be a child of. What it can be used for is you can use this to store general information about your world. If you want to be really specific about, okay, in this campaign world, we've got forces of magic, do this. If you're Brendan Sanderson, you write a 16 page document on all the different ways that everything works and details and a lot of GMs like to do that. They like to build that out. That's what this campaign world is for. You can put all that information up there so it's easy to locate. It's all gathered in one place. You don't have to go looking for it. And it also gives you access to child descriptions, which we will talk about here just in a bit. Let's say you want to create a, um, a new location. Let's say uh, you want to have a palace that the players are going to go to confront the evil overlord, uh, this evil undead overlord in this campaign we're creating. Um, so let's go ahead and create that. Um, we'll call it the Palace of the Dead, ominous name. We could give it an image if we happen to have one. 
And we'll talk a little bit here in a bit about how images works and things like that, especially when we get to the map. We'll load in something like that. We have our image, and then we can have a read aloud. A lot of times when you have a character walking into a dungeon, a lot of times there's a little bit of text you want to throw at the players This just as soon as they show up that just says, in this room, it's a 10 by 10. There's an orc in the corner. He's guarding a treasure chest. Uh, the walls are green. The floor is blue. You can say something about the night air stinks of evil as you approach uh, this horrific looking castle. Screams seem to continually split the air. You can have a more of a description for you, giving more information about basically like the castle is the 20 feet tall. It's made of black obsidian, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then child description. I'll go ahead and click this in here so we can see this a little bit better. Let's turn previews off. Oh, you don't have to leave those on if you don't want to see exactly what you're typing in terms of formatting and things like that. So child descriptions, it says notes displayed on all children. I've talked about how you can often have structures related to other structures. I'm going to have this evil castle location thing and maybe it's going to have multiple floors. Each floor may have a different style to it. Maybe it'll have different effects on it. Um, and a lot of times you'll get those notes that you create for what you're building out that um, have to do with a particular area or location. Um, maybe certain spells work here differently. Maybe the walls are made of this, the floors are made of that. Because you always get that player's like, what's the lighting like in here? And you're like, oh, okay, I put the lighting notes for the entire floor. You don't want to have to put that lighting note in every room. You just want to make one lighting note and say, all rooms are lit with ever-burning torches. Done. You'll see when I actually create children underneath it, that note will be available to it when I'm running the game. In view mode, I can see that note. So we can also add in a few other things. The walls are 10 feet thick. And maybe there's a spell effect going on. Maybe this place is consecrated to the deity of the Pallid Princess, one of the deities of undeath in Pathfinder 2nd Ed. And so you might want to put down the castle is under a... Consecrate a spell to Uragotha. Now, we'll take a brief aside here. So, when we say, okay, it's a consecrated spell to Uragotha, you might think, oh no, now I have to remember what the consecrate spell does and what does that mean. And what are the details in Urgotha? What's her follower alignment? What's her edicts? What's her anathema? I have to remember that and I have to go look that up. Well, we understand that can be such a pain, but there are a lot of great resources that already exist on the internet. For example, Archives of Nethys has done a wonderful job in creating a site that has a lot of this information already available on the internet and you just need the link to it. Now you may be like, well, I have to go to the website, look this up, copy the link in. We have worked with Archives at Nethys and they provided us an index that we have sorted out and put into the game, much like we, we can do with other SRDs out there. We're not meaning to be a repository for rules or anything like that, but if they exist already, we'd love to be able to link to them so you can have easy access. Now you may remember I had that when I was working with events, I created a reference, so I type at. If I go to rule systems, I can type in Pathfinder 2nd Ed, and we're going for the spell, so this is Rituals. So we'll go ahead and select Rituals, and then we'll just type in Consecrate. And boom, now we have a link directly to the Consecrate Ritual right there in our descriptions. We could do the same thing with Uragatha. So again, Rule Systems, Pathfinder 2nd Ed, um, and this time it's deities, and then we type in the name of the deity in question here, Uragatha, and boom, now we have a link to that. Now I don't have to worry about that. Uh, I can save this, and if you check the preview, those are links right there, and if I right-click and open that in the new tab, 
I'm taken directly to Archives and that's his site. It tells me what the spell is and I haven't left my own notes. I didn't have to come here and look it up. It's just quick and easy. Again, is it a major problem to do this on your own? No, but is it a little bit more time that you have to take every time you do something like that? And again, the whole point of this is so that you can quickly get back to what you want to be doing, which is interacting with your players. You don't want to be looking rules up. You don't want to be looking up deity names and things like that. You want these things to be quick because you're here to have fun. You're here to interact with the players and have them interact back with you. We've created that description for this, this, this palace floor here. Now we can go ahead and create things inside this palace. For example, I could create an entire floor. I could say the ground floor. So now I've got a ground floor as a child. If I go to the ground floor, and remember I said that when you're looking at it, notes from parents, there's that note already there. So in addition to all of the information I can already have here, talking about the floor is, this guy is completely different than you expect. Well lit with plenty of windows and gold trim. And we can have that all here and then we can create a child underneath that. Maybe we have a main hall as a child under that. And maybe we also have off that main hall, there is a throne room. So now we have two different things which are on this floor here, this main hall and this throne room here. I can, I can go to that and I can go ahead and in the main hall, maybe we give it an image. Let's go just to quickly go through here. There's a great hall image I've got. Let's save that. And now if your, your players are exploring this and you're doing a little bit more of a dungeon crawl type thing, you may want to go from the main hall to the nearby throne room, which you know is connected. But you may, basically you're like, oh, maybe I have to go, I have to go back to the parent, the ground floor, and then I have to click on children, and then I can jump over to the throne room from there. Well, so that's a couple extra clicks. And again, we're all about making this a little bit faster. So instead, you also have associated locations, which we usually tend to mean rooms which are connected to this room, not necessarily under one group, because let's say you have a staircase again from floor one to floor two, and you want to separate that out so it's a different parent, but you still want them connected so you can jump between them. We can associate an existing location. We can say the main hall we created earlier. And there it is. Now we've got that there. Now we can quickly jump back and forth between the main hall and the throne room just like that. And we don't have to go looking back and go back up to the parent to get to it, etc., etc. Let's go back to the ground floor, though. There's an even easier way. A lot of times when you're running an adventure, you'll create a map. So let's go to the parent here. We've got this ground floor and we want to create a map and we want to attach this map to that. Now we don't currently have a map loaded. I've already created a map. Let's go ahead and load that in. So we're going to talk about images here really quickly. So you have an image library in Lorelink and it's a fully featured kind of thing. There will be limits on how much you can upload based on your subscription level. During testing, there currently aren't any limits, but eventually they're going to come into place. You can create folders. You can search through those folders. You can add tags and things like that. So for example, if I go to all those people you saw earlier, so I've got all these image created in here. I've got tags associated with them to make searching for them easier. I've got keywords. I've got the alt text there so that screen readers and things like that can pick those up. So I'm not disenfranchising anybody else who wants to be in this campaign because of what tools they may be using. So let's say I want to add a new map. So let's go to the map folder here and I'll click add image. And so I'm going to quickly type in ground floor plan, and then maybe I'll keep, add some keywords of maps, palace, uh, and then the description for the alt text. So this is a ground floor, a main hall, two large, rooms with many windows branching off of it. And then let's go ahead and drag in our image here. All right, and we'll save that. Now you can see I've uploaded that map right there. I can pull it up, I can look at it. It's got my tags on it, all set to go. So let's go back to that ground floor. 
we talked in terms of wanting to make this easy. We have got this hierarchy set up. So you, if you want to create things off of child, you've got this button here. Let's see, again, just little time savers that we like to throw in here. So let's go to the ground floor. Let's add that map. We'll go to the map folder, ground floor. And if I want to, for this particular one, I could change it. If I wanted to say this is, let's get ominous ground floor. I could change it for just this particular instance of it. But now that I've added that, I've got that there. If I quickly refresh the page, oops, I forgot to save. That was my problem. Associating an image doesn't link it, you need to save it. So if you lose something and you're like, oh, I thought I associated with it, just because you inserted it doesn't mean you necessarily wanted to save it. You need to actually click save. There we go. Now this map has been added. Now let's reload. And we will see that the map is now available as an option. We click on that. We can now see the map that we imported. But it'd be even more useful if we could actually click on those locations. A lot of times you'll get maps in modules, for example, if you're not building your own, maybe you're building a module out. It'll have A1, A2, A3, A4, A5. Sometimes they'll be in an order that makes sense, sometimes not. But in any case, you have to go to that and you're like, okay, A1, what one A1 again? Is A1 the kitchen? Is A1 the bathrooms? Is A1 the front hall? Okay, where is that? What if instead we allowed you to add hotspots to the map? And so let's go ahead and maybe we'll call this room the throne room. And maybe we'll call this the main hall, just to name that. So now we have those locations right there. We can change if we want, if we decide, oh no, maybe this isn't the throne room. Maybe instead we want this to be, we want this to be the palace or something else. We could change it back and forth. We could come in here and edit it. We could delete it if we wanted to. Or if we want to move it, you can come up here to move mode and you could say, no, actually, that's the room's gonna be the, that room over here is gonna be the kitchen. Let's go ahead and move this one to this room over here. And now that it is there, we can go ahead and save that. So now if we go and look at this in view mode, you can see that the edit options have been removed, but now we can click on that and say main hall. And so it tells us main hall, we click on it, it automatically takes us to the main hall, just like that. And now basically now we can easily navigate between our areas on the map it's just one more way of making it a little bit easier to go back and forth between all of these different locations without having to hop around and flip pages back and forth in your notes or in a module or something like that. All right, now we've got all the, now we've got these places. We should probably put some stuff in it. So we'll go ahead and talk about game objects and what they represent next. All right, let's talk about game objects next. Now we've kind of brushed on this in a couple of different areas because game objects are kind of the, the props that you fill everything else with. They're the actors in your events. They're the items and other things you put in your locations. They're all of those things. Let's go ahead and create some game objects and show you how that works. Game objects are relatively straightforward. They're blank templates on purpose because, again, they're the building blocks that you're building everything else with. If you want to have characters, like we talked about earlier, we have the priest. So the priest can be a character. If you want to add other NPCs and things like that, those fall under this category. Creatures could be things like monsters. For example, if I wanted to say a skeleton showed up here, I could do skeleton. I can say maybe a creature level one or negative one, I think they are in Pathfinder. And then I can have a description. I could save that. And now they show up as a creature, just like that. I can go in here. I can associate an image with them. There we go, monsters, skeleton, cool. Um, Go ahead and insert that. Now we have an image for it. Now we can type a description for it. And again, like we talked about a little bit more detail in locations, rules references can really make your life a lot easier. In this case, if we say Pathfinder to, oops, make sure we click on it. There we go. We say monsters. I can just call out their skeletal champion, skeletal horse, giant, guard. Let's say I want to use the steps in the guard. 
I can just link that there. And now I've built that out and I'm linking to the actual Pathfinder 2 hosted on Archives of Nethys stats and things like that. So I don't have to fill them out here. I can. I can either build these out as their own thing. Basically, and have like a string 15, dex 16, etc., etc. I could build that out like that. I could also use custom fields that we talked about. And I can have a whole set of custom fields that can be like strength. And this is a strength. And it's a short field, which means if you're a programmer, you may be going short isn't a number. No, this is a short text field. There's a short text field. There's a long text field. There's an actual number. Or you can have an image. So I could say a short text. I could add that in. Then I'm like, wait, maybe I don't want it to be a short. I can't really change it. So I can delete it. It's gone. And now I can get another one. And I can say strength. And instead, I want this to be a number, let's say number and I can just keep adding those I can add multiple of those strength I can even have I can have an attack field which could be a larger field that discusses their actual types of attack and index is going to be how they're listed on the page so if I want this one to appear after strength I could save it like that it's asking me to reload the page just so it can show that and if I come up here you can see strength is here as a number field. There's attack, just like that. The key thing is, is if I'm going to create a lot of different monsters, it may become a pain to keep adding those custom fields. That's where we have the, if you do it once, and you go, oh, actually, I want to do this a lot. We have this button here that says Create Template from Lore. You can click on that. Um, only default and custom fields with their values will be copied to the template. I click Confirm. And then I can link to it and it's going to override them because it's going to link it to the template. So now the skeleton is based on the skeleton template. If I go to creatures, I can see I have a skeleton template here. So I can instead, if I wanted to change this to, let's say, a Pathfinder 2e creature template. And now if I save that, I've got this image. I could be like, okay, I don't think the image should be in there. So I can remove that image. Uh, delete that. I can say creature level instead. Now, if I do all of this, because the skeleton is still linked to it, if I click save, I'm going to blank all of that out. So now this is available as a template that looks like that. If I go back up here, you'll note the fact that this name of this creature in here changed to that because they were linked, which means any changes I make to the template are reflected on anything I've created from it. If I needed to update something that I want to change all of the things based on that template, I can change the template and it automatically updates all of it. If I want to break it, so for example, I want this to have a unique name, I can unlock it here and then I can type in skeleton. And now this is called a skeleton again and I can unlock the image as well and reassign that to be the skeleton image. And I can save that. And if I look at that, now it is separate from the template, but it's still linked. So if I go to creature level, if I want to call it CR because I'm feeling old school, I can go CR and I can save that. If I go back to creatures, it's changed the sort description or as well. And that is a way you can save yourself from having to create something over and over and over again. You might do that with an item, for example. You may create an item template that is a lot of different basically magic items. It's going to be, they have specific stats, like you want crafting time or things like that. Or maybe you're creating a bunch of wands and you don't want to keep copying in that same text on how wands work. Or you're, if you're smart, you're linking to it on AON using that rules reference. You can just create the template. Items are going to be your items. Villains, if you wanted to create your villains. So if I wanted to have the, basically the undead overlord, and I just put that in there. I create a, grab a quick picture for him. Let's say people, undead king. There we go. That'll work great. Grab that. I can have a bunch of stuff in here. King Lichdar was old even when the dragons were young, etc., etc. And I can put all my background I need about that in there. I can create an item if I need to put an item someplace, like the 
Magic Orb of Dragon Command. McGuffin, McGuffin, depends on how you want to look at it, whether it's Mick or Mac. It's up to you. And you can have the descriptions in there. You can have stats. You can have once a cast, dominate, monster, on a dragon, or something like that. Now I have this item. Transportation, basically you could be an airship in a fantasy campaign, a starship. If you're having a traveler game, obviously cargo space and things like that could be a big thing and you want to have to deal with all of that. So that could be in there. And you, again, you can create templates for those because I know Starfinder has templates for their spaceships and their mechs. So if you're creating those, you may want templates for that so you can get those stats the same. Now that I've created these items, I can go back into things like my location. Let's put in the throne room. That's where our bad guys. So we have an associate game object. We can say associate. And it's going to list my different types of game objects here. And I want to say the undead overlord is in there. And I associate that there. And boom, now the villain is in his throne room and he's listed in that location. So I can quickly jump to there. And again, remember, instead of having to include him in that list, I can use the at symbol type villains and then say undead overlord. Boom, now I've got a link to him in my description, just like that. You can also do the same thing and associate at events. So again, defying the undead king. Maybe you want to associate the undead king in there as well. Undead overlord. I can find him. There we go. So there, he saved. Locations you can add items to. So in the main hall, maybe the orb is just laying there on the ground in the main hall for whatever reason you've decided to put it there. You can associate the game object there. There's our magic orb of dragon command, associate. Now it's sitting there and it's associated with that location, just like that. All of that is there. And again, remember, basically they, while they are the building blocks and you can build up to them, don't always think that, oh, I've got to stop and create all of my characters, all of my creatures, all of my villains, all at once. What you can do instead is, if some people, that's the way their brain works. They want to build all the building blocks, the lower level first, and then build up from there. Some people are more scatter-minded. They want to go through things, and as they think of them, you can go into here and just create them as one shot. So if I suddenly go, oh, I want actually not just the Orb of Dragon Command, I want the Sword of Undead Slaying to be here from a previous hero. And so I'm going to save that, and I've just quickly created that. And if I want to associate that as well, I can associate that right there. And now the sort of undead slang is also right there. Boom. Just like that. I don't have to deal with jumping back and forth. I don't have to leave this page. I don't have to abandon my train of thought. I can just create it as I'm thinking about it right there. Again, the whole point of Lore Link is that you're creating these things and then linking them together as you come up with them. So we wanted to make it as easy as possible to connect them all together. All right, we've got a lot of different categories and things like that, but you may want to add your own categorizations to things. And so that's why we have tags. Okay, we've talked about a lot of different categories of different types of lore. We have characters, creatures, villains, items, locations, events. All of those types of lore are all scattered around out there. And we feel it captures a good percentage of what users of Lorelink are going to be entering in. However, that doesn't mean that we think we've thought of everything. We realize that, especially in more complicated games, maybe you want to break things down even finer. For example, if you're playing more of a vampire the masquerade type game where you have different organizations and groups or you're maybe you're playing a blades in the dark or forge in the dark where things are a little bit more you've got different groups all over the place which are doing different things and have different motivations and it's important to keep track of who's with who or even if you're just doing something as simple as a pathfinder society game and oftentimes those have special events for people who are people who are in certain groups you may want to create your own tags so that you can keep track of them. So, for example, let's say we have this list of characters here. We've got King Nevermind, the Guard, the Priest, the Elven Ambassador. Maybe we've got the Villain and things like that. Maybe they belong to a couple of different groups and we want to be able to keep track of them. So maybe we create a tag for a group called the King's Hand or something like that. And we'll call them Royalists. And, and we just call this a group 
dedicated to keeping the king on the throne. We get a parent text because maybe you have, let's say you're playing a supernatural type game where you have mortals and you have supernatural type. Parent tags are a quick and easy way of organizing that. Much like we did hierarchy in locations, we have, you can do hierarchies in tags as well. But so the king's hands, you can come in here and you can say, okay, and what game objects do we want? We can say the king is part of that group. And we can say that maybe, let's say the king and the guard. The guard is also dedicated to that group as well. There, now we've added those two things. And now that they're associated with them, we can come over to the king and we can see up here at the top that we've added the king's hand as a tag for them. Um, and so you can look at other things and be like, okay, well, maybe we want to, maybe we want the elven ambassador to be a king's hand. So we can click on that. And just like that, they're part of it. We decide, no, maybe not. Uncheck it and it's gone. You can create new tags, just as simple as going, oh, let's create a, the gray hands. And we can click create tag since it doesn't exist. And boop, it pops up. And now it's it's automatically checked. And you can have multiple tags. So the gray hands, the woodland folk. And you can just keep creating tags just like that. And it doesn't just have to be game objects and things like that. The villain can have it. An item could be associated with a particular I think locations could be. Maybe you have a, maybe this group has a headquarters and a main hall. And so you want to be like, oh, the main hall, that's obviously where the king's hand people meet. And so we can tag it just like that. Maybe we want certain events to be associated with certain groups or certain organizations. For example, earlier I talked about in Pathfinder Society, certain events are keyed to certain groups that the player characters might be involved in. And so maybe you're like, oh, okay, let's go over to... Uh, the city of ruins and we'll say that is a woodland folk event we come over to tag you see we've created these here we can click on it and if we need a quick listing of okay who of all is involved in the woodland folk okay what events are associated with them what locations are associated with them all of those are stored right there so you have a quick and easy way of organizing things and categorizing things. Say you have a point system that you're keeping track of where if you do certain favors for a group, you want to keep track of that. Or maybe just keeping track of notes or other things associated with that group. This tag gives you a kind of a section where you can set it up and basically associate everything with it and keep all that information in one place as opposed to being like, okay, I need to create a event called it maybe it's a crazy is this the king's hand it's really more of a group so how do i design a creature where do i store that information do i store it on the king because it's kind of the head of it but you could just instead create the group as a tag then put all that information and associate it with the tag giving you one place to find all of that information really quickly and it also enables you to quickly look at a character and be like Oh, okay, wait, does this character have a secret motivation or something like that where they actually, oh, they're part of the king's hand. Okay, cool. Just like that, you can look that up and see that. And you don't have to go looking, combing through notes or other things to figure out what secret organizations you may or may not have put somebody in. Maybe they're double crossing somebody else and they have multiple associations, things like that. Easy, quick, it's all just right there. All right, let's talk about timelines. Uh, a lot of times, maybe you're generating things, and there's two kind of uses for timelines. Timelines could be a list of things which have happened before the game. If you're the type of person who creates an expansive campaign world and you want to be able to keep track of King Henry I was followed by King George II, which was followed by King uh, Queen Elizabeth I, and you want all these time periods set up so you can keep track of all of these different events and who was ruling when, and all this information is important to your campaign because you're building this living world. And when one of your players asks you these things or you're building off of that, you want to have that information available so you don't say something wrong and then, oops, now you've got to resort and rejigger all, all, all your stuff. And the other thing you can use timelines for is if you have a general flow for your game that you're planning, that you're wanting to keep things going in a straight line, 
not necessarily on the on railroad tracks, but you have things going on in the background which will happen no matter what the players are doing. Maybe the evil overlord is massing their minions. Maybe they're sending messengers to other kingdoms. And so depending on what order they visit, what kingdoms, basically they may encounter, basically you want them to be like, oh, the evil overlord has already been to this kingdom, but he hasn't been to this one yet, and things like that. And so you're keeping all of that on track. And sometimes it's just as easy as you want to keep track of seasons. And you want to be able to say, okay, these events take place in spring, now it's summer, now it's fall, now it's winter. So when one of your players asks, hey, what, what's the temperature outside? Or even as in a werewolf game, somebody asks you, hey, what's the moon status? You could be like, aha, I've got that on my timeline. So basically, the events that we're looking at right now take place under a new moon. Done. All right, how do timelines work? They're relatively straightforward. Um, when you're going to create a timeline, you're probably going to create a group of events first, and then you're going to come into your timeline and be like, okay, now I'm going to create a timeline. I'm going to call it maybe the way things were, or maybe the storyline. Maybe I'll just create something. Main thread. So I'm going to create that. And so now I'm going to go in there. And so you have this timeline up here at the top and you're going to be able to associate events with it. So if you come in here and you're like, okay, meeting with the priest is the first event. And then after that event, we will say, I can associate ambush at the end. And if I want to associate something and I go, oh, I haven't created it yet. Let's go with travel to the city. Um, Let's put that at two. Oops, I accidentally associated two at zero, but I can come up to the timeline here, grab this, move it to one, and that will reset that. So now you can see the index is zero, one, two. I can sort by that index. If I need to remove something, I can unlink it. If I want to go to that event, I can click go to, and edit takes me to this screen where I set the index if I want to change the index this way as opposed to dragging across the grid up on top. So that's how you can add a series of events to a timeline. Now, there are a couple of other things you may want to do. For example, if these events were instant historic events and I wanted to indicate that the first two happened under the reign of King Marigold the Magnificent, I can create an interval and say starts at zero, ends at one, I could call this the reign of King Marigold. If I want to basically good times in the kingdom, then I could save that. So now I have reign of the King Marigold. And I, you can see it's right there. If I click on it, it'll basically it'll show me that. If I click on these other events, it'll, it'll show me what they are as well. I can zoom out or in on this. So that's a, that is a way you can set up intervals that take place. We talked about seasons. Maybe you want these things to actually be a certain season. So you can say between one to two is spring season. Mile temps. So now I can keep track of those things relatively quickly and easily without having to resort to looking at notes and figuring out what time periods or what was when. You have also you may also have noticed that it talks about sessions. We'll talk about sessions here in a little bit, but sessions are essentially a play session with your players. You've sat down, you've played the game. And maybe you want to say, associate a session with a timeline. Maybe you want to say that this timeline was everything that happened in the session and here are the events that happened and here's the order that they happened because you want to keep your notes organized that way. Or maybe you want to say, I've got this main overall storyline and I want a series of different sets of events. So these two events were session one, these two events were session two. If you looked at the session, the interval rather, you can associate a session with those. You can also associate a timeline. So you can have essentially sub timelines underneath a timeline. You can say, okay, this is basically if you want, you just want a single dot on here that says Reign of King Marigold. And then the next one, it says Reign of Queen Susie. You can have those as individual associated timelines, and then you could break down all the events that happened during their reigns as their own timelines, rather than cramming all that information into one historic timeline. That is it for timelines. So since we started talking about sessions, let's move on to that.
Okay, sessions. Sessions are finally the point you've come down to. You're actually sitting down with your players at the table with everything you've created. And so now you've got a ton of stuff. Maybe in Lorelink you've got a ton of events and different locations and some characters and some creatures and villains. And that's a lot of stuff to keep track of. And you may be like, I really just want to know what I'm doing this session. Or you're coming back to a previous session. You're like, what did we even cover last session? Did we get through everything that I planned? I can't remember. I want to know what happened last session. And that's what sessions are here for. When you're actually sitting down with your players and going through the game. It's a quick one-stop kind of area that you can come to that lets you view all of the stuff you may or may not need for a session. Brief aside, which we've talked about players a little bit, we are, if Lore Link is going to be doing more with players in the future. For now, we mostly just have a place for you to stick information about the players that are going to be in your game. It is not, not currently accessible to those players, but in, in the future, there will be additional things that will allow you to connect to players and let players have their own stats and their own notes and things like that, and you have access to them. But for right now, this is an area where you can store information about the players, the player name, a short description about the player, maybe a longer description, maybe an image they've given you, maybe the stats. If, you, if you're in a game which is particularly stat-heavy and you want to keep track of that. Again, custom fields as a template. If you wanted to, for example, you wanted all your players to have the same set of stat things you want to keep track of. For example, there are three fields that you always seem to need for a Pathfinder game. You're like, oh, I need to check your perception. I want to check your AC and I want to check your hit points. So I want to call those out as custom fields so I don't have to sort through the description to find them. I just want to call out those individual fields so I can quickly see them, pull them up, things like that. Maybe they're associated with other things in the game. Maybe they're like, oh, this person is currently carrying and maybe they're carrying this sort of undead slang so you want to make sure that you associate them. So that's a quick way of doing that. And then, of course, notes. So that's the kind of what players are here for. They're not really a fully fleshed out section yet, but there will be more on that coming later. But back to sessions. So you've sat down with your players and you're like, okay, this is session one, we'll say. And it's the start of the adventure. Maybe you want more of a description of what's going, you plan on happening. Let's get the players meet, the priest, get ambushed, and then start the overland trek. Okay. And you can say what date you're planning on playing this on. So let's say June 22nd. We're planning on playing this one, and we have a status for you're planning it. It's currently active because it's the one you're running, or it's completed, so you can easily sort through ones you're working on and which ones you're actively playing and which ones you're marking as, okay, those are done. I don't need to think about them as much until I want to come back and look at them. So we'll keep that one in planning. We'll save that. As you can see, it does show up. We have a little calendar up here. It does show up on there. And so now I can go into the session and a session is essentially a big set of lists because you have all of this information you've created and you want to narrow it down to a particular set of things you think will happen. So let's say we think some events are going to happen. So we talked about the, the meeting with the priest. Let's associate that one. Let's associate the ambush at the end. And let's associate the... Travel to the city, and let's associate the city in ruins. There we go. Okay, so now we have all of those associated in there. Maybe we want to associate some locations. Let's quick create the city, the temple city. Let's just do that. I think I've got an image for that. Let's create a. Let's grab a quick mood image for that one. City on fire. That works. I will just leave that one for there right now. Okay. So now basically we've associated these things and I'm like, okay, I think these things are going to happen. I want to associate the priest in here. Maybe I want to associate, the, maybe he hands them, maybe we talk about the sword of a dead slang. So we'll add that as well. So again, you're adding all of this thing so that when it comes time for the session, you can come in here and be like, oh, okay. 
what am I planning to get done this session? Here are the events I'm planning on happening. Here are the locations I'm planning on going to. Here are the game objects I'm thinking uh, could be associated with it. We talked about timelines. So if you want to say this session takes place during a certain set of time on the timeline, you can associate with an interval. So you can look and see if you're like, okay, I'm going to create a couple of events that happen in the background. What happened during this session that my players weren't aware of? Okay, the bad guy moved his troops here, and then he sent an emissary to this kingdom here to uh, convince them to join him or die. Um, these things happen in the background, and now I can use that interval to, to look at that, and I can understand, okay, that's right, these things are happening at the same time. But we all know that sessions are... A nebulous thing. Game sessions are social events. You are here to have a good time with your friends, and that means spending time with your friends. And that sometimes means maybe you do more talking about other things than the game. Maybe you are a strict game master, and when you show up to the game, you're going to get through these things, and you keep your players on track and on time, and more power to you. But other times people are just like, oh, this is a social thing, we're talking, we're doing these things. Or maybe your players just, you know, the meeting with the priest happens, and they do that, and then they wander off, and they're like, okay, now that we're going to do that, we need to go look up this other stuff. Yes, he knows he says it's an emergency, we need to get going, but we really want to go talk to the mayor of the town to find out if he's heard anything. Can we check with this resource to see if maybe they know something? We need to go buy new swords because we need undead stuff. Oh, hey, and maybe you end up creating a weird side quest on the side and things like that. So all of those things can change over the course of a session. So we've created sessions to be really flexible. So if you come in here and you need to add a new event, so if, say for example, the blacksmith side quest that they just created on their thing, quest to find a hammer. And so now basically, now that's associated as well. And because you wanted to keep track of that one happened in here as well. But maybe you want to keep track of, okay, the meeting with the priest happened, the ambush at the inn happened, and the blacksmith side quest happened. But these two things didn't happen. Now we've marked these things as completed. So if we come back to the session later after it's done, and I'm like, did we actually get to the temple? No, we didn't get to the temple. We didn't travel to the city. We didn't see the city in ruins. We didn't do those events. Okay, now you come into here, you've quickly gotten an update, and now you know how to plan for the next session. And to help you with that, we also have the ability to check these. You can either say select incomplete, or you can select individual ones. And then with the selected ones, you can copy or move those to new or existing sessions. So you can say, okay, I want to leave them in here to remind me that I was planning five events and we only did three. Okay, I want that's important information for me to know for planning. How many do we actually go through versus how many do I plan? And one of these was brand new. And so, okay, I want to keep track of that. Or maybe you want to move them because you want to keep this clean and you want to be like, okay, I just want to see what we actually did in this session. Maybe you already have the session set up and you want to copy them in. You can copy them in or you could say move and say move to new session and you can create session two just like that. Truck overland. And we'll say that that one is going to get played a week later. Oops, excuse me. Now that we have that, I have moved those to a new session. They're gone from here. And let's say I need, I want to move the uh, temple over as well. I can say instead, move to an existing session, or maybe we'll copy that one. Copy to an existing session. And we can copy that to session two, which we just created from the move. We can copy that one there. Now, if we go to sessions, we can see session one exists and there's session two. And we talked about timelines earlier. If we wanted to mark the fact that those first two events, again, basically remember we have event one here, which is ambush at the inn. Oops, that's meeting with the priest. Let's flip those, put that there. Meeting with the priest. All right. Let's move that one there and then move this one here. All right, there we go. Ambush at the end. Meeting with the priest. And we have this interval here. We may want to say, which instead of this being the reign of King Marigold, let's go ahead and edit that to say session one events. We can just put that as session one. And now we know on our timeline. 
we can look session one events and we can see, okay, those two happened. And if we go to that session, we can see that that session is now associated with an interval. Just like that, we now have all this information just quickly stored for us. And of course, as always, notes are there. So last note on running stuff in Lorelink. Eventually, we are going to be adding new features like more of a GM screen that will allow you to organize your information on your screen how you want it and, and add in other things like encounter management and things like that. But for right now, the easiest way to get around and look at things and not have to deal with all the edit boxes and things like that is switch to view mode. That allows you to quickly hop around, see just the information you've entered, not empty boxes of stuff that you haven't entered. You can look at things, you can quickly pop around, you can basically view events, view locations, ambush at the end we didn't put much into, uh, but like meeting at the priest, you have all that information there. Locations, for example, we talked about the ground floor. We've got that map. We've got those hot spots on those map. When you're in view mode, you can click on them and it takes you to them. Now we're at the main hall. You've got the tag system. You can jump around that. All of that is available in view mode in a much smaller, much faster view. So you just have the information on the screen, which is important. Now, if you want to add something in here, you don't want to jump back into edit mode. Remember, we have that create new note button down here in the corner that will allow you to quickly add a note to whatever it is you're looking at and just say, King's hands were betrayed. You save that and that note's associated even though you're in view mode. So all of that is right there and it just lets you quickly just hop around and see just the information that you want to see. All right. That is all I have to talk about here for Lorelink. There is a lot of information, obviously. We created a whole campaign, heavy air quotes around that, in basically just over an hour or so. Obviously, it's going to take you longer when you're actually inputting all of the notes and things that you're thinking of, but each individual piece is relatively quick to set up. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this, to look through this, and we hope that if you have any questions, concern, feedback, that you feel free to contact us. There is a contact link up at the top of the page. So again, thank you very much, and we will catch you later.